Welcome to the Championship Club Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Casey, and co-hosting with me is a man with over 300 Championship Rugby appearances. It's Ben Gulliver. Be sure to check us out on social media at Champ Clubs Pod on Instagram and Twitter and head to YouTube to like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, past the halfway point now in this uh, championship season, Gully, and uh, another round of fixtures at the weekend. Round six, it was some big wins for Ealing and Saris, but we'll we'll save those for today's guests elsewhere. Uh, Hecker result at Dillingham Park, 43-41 win for Amptill over Hartbury. Bedford seemed to find their groove against Richmond, a 38-10 win at Goldington Road. Uh, and there was a pretty tight encounter between Cornish Pirates and Nottingham, perhaps tighter than some predicted, but Pirates coming out with the win. Uh, what have you made of the, the results this weekend, Ben? Yeah, it's been a, been an interesting weekend. Um, I watched watched the Amtel game on Saturday, I think it was, and Hartbury were, were cruising. Um, I touched base with Tommy this week, and I think they gave him an old-school roasting at halftime. Um, which I've been on the end of, and it's uh, it's an interesting ten minutes that with Mark Lavery and and Tommy. Uh, then they managed to sneak a win with 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 Grimaldi knocking one over at the death. Uh, I think it's forty three forty one. So hell of a game there at Dillingham Park. Um, then sort of touching on on the Bedford Bedford win. Bedford looked like they're hitting their straps. Not a, their Saints boys have settled in nicely now. Uh, bit of a shout out to Tom Tom Litchfield. He was. Um, I used to coach him in year eight, I think it was, when I was working at a school up in Bedfordshire and he's 18. And it's great to see someone that I've been involved with doing so well at that level. And I think he's, like I said, he's just turned 18 and fair play to him picking up man of the match and getting in our team of the week. Um, and then Pirates, Pirates got a, a tough win on the, a tough win away at Nottingham. Uh, I think Nottingham are slightly improving. Uh, we said that a few weeks ago, didn't we? That, these teams are settling in. It's only five games into a, into a season. Um, so not to go in a little bit better. Pirates just keep picking up injury after injury. I think they're on their third ACL. And they've had an Achilles go as well. So they're, they're pulling in the lone players from where they can. Uh, but a good five-point win off the, off the back of a tough few weeks for Pirates. Yeah, surmised nicely. And uh, going into to this weekend then, obviously, it's the big one. It's, it's the one that a lot of people are talking about. Of course, Ealing versus Saracens. And with that note, it's uh, a pleasure to introduce today's guest as we've got a man in each camp from Saracens. He's played over, two, well, very nearly 200 games for the club. He's a Premiership and Championship Champions Cup winner and a bit of a cult hero at the Stonex. Richard Barrington, pleasure to have you on, mate. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. And then on the other side, and from Ealing, ex of Wasps and of Lesser Tigers, over 100 Premiership appearances in total are now blazing a trail with the Trail Finders. Guy Thompson, it's fantastic to have you on as well. Cheers, guys. Thanks very much for having me. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll jump into uh, you guys' uh, respective games from the weekend. Uh, Baz, we'll, we'll dig into the, uh, the Donny Saracens one because I can talk about that when I was here. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of headlines are Owen Farrell back in the side, um, all the England boys sort of back in the group and sort of a Saracen side that I guess people that have watched Saracens over the years would be familiar with. And, uh, you know, Donny went into the game unbeaten and really proud of what we've achieved up here so far and getting a few mentions for the um, performances, but uh, a very business-like 50 points to 15 win from from your lads. No, definitely. Um we uh, had the whole week talking about Donny, how they've uh, not lost a game and how their four pack works and playing them in the preseason uh, trail finders cup as well. We knew a bit more about them and we knew it was going to be a test up there. I mean, it was good that we had uh, six or seven internationals back playing for us and uh, gave us the, the, the power up front, but no, uh, coming off the bench as well, it just uh, was a stern performance from Donny and they didn't give up. Even the scoreline didn't really reflect on how hard they worked because I thought they were amazing. Hey Baz, good to see you, mate. Uh, just a quick one. Just if we rewind a little bit before the before the cup and Sarri's approach into into this year. Um, a little birdie tells me that a few, a few of the boys that had played sort of champ rugby gave gave sort of a bit of insight into into what the league's about. Can you can you just sort of share your thoughts on it, having played before, and the rest of the boys in your squad that had? No, yeah, we uh, we had a, um, a slideshow from Alex Day, who I think has played for. Bedford and he was a legend down at Cornish Pirates so he gave us uh, the low downs and the uh, of the stadiums we're going to and uh, told us what we got coming ahead of us and he gave us a really good presentation and, um, and how hard it's going to be 
there's a lot of the boys who haven't played championship rugby. Uh, I was fortunate to play back in 2012 with Guy, actually, for Jersey. And uh, sometimes you don't know what you're stepping into. And he gave us a good, good uh, PowerPoint of uh, what we're going to what we're going to get over the year. So it was a bit, a bit of a com comedy gold in there as well. But with Daisy, um, you get a bit of that. So, yeah. <laughs> nice to be a fly on the wall in that. <laughs> yeah. And good fun. Guy, of course, uh, another huge win for, for you guys at the weekend against Jersey. I mean, the, the results have been outstanding from Ealing so far. Um, what's the feedback from, from the weekend's game and the, and the start of the season thus far down at, down at Vallis Way? Yeah, it was a it was a decent hit out uh, for us against Jersey. We we built it up a week as a as a bit of a rivalry. Um, as you guys will know, we kind of came up through the leagues against each other. I, I was playing for Jersey against the Healing back then as well. Um, so it was really important that we got to a good start. We we emphasised that first twenty minutes was really really important. We knew they were going to come physically. We also knew they had a few injuries recently, um, and maybe some of their results didn't really reflect how they were playing. So we knew we had to be on it from the word go. We made sure we were, and, and we were happy with the performance. So we'll we'll dive into it, Baz. Of course, the the, the set of um, circumstances which bring Saracens to the league are slightly unusual, and Ealing's performances so far are catching all sorts of attentions. I'll, I'll just come out and say it: how how fearful, how scared are Saracens of what of what Ealing are doing at the moment? In what, let's be honest, is a, a season kind of massive ramifications for the club. Uh, we've had a, we've had a good week's training. We've we're taking a, this is our biggest game of the season. Um, I've just said Ealing were undefeated. Uh, I think they've scored fifty one tries in six games. We can't uh, underestimate what's going to come on the weekend. So um, just we're ha we're going through what we need to go through, preparing ourselves for the game and stuff. Um, no, I think we're we're really looking forward to uh, having two good teams go at it on the weekend. So uh, it should be a good game. And then, then I suppose sort of flip it over to to Guy. <laughs> How things you're in, like what's you know it must be mouth watering week. Your you boys are flying, um, and then obviously you got the the big dogs coming into town this week. And how's how's prep been for you this weekend? This week, so yeah, yeah, it's been good. I was I'm quite impressed with Baz doing his uh, doing his data actually, doing his research on us there. Um, <laughs> no, look, we we <laughs> we understand that it's a, a massive game for both clubs. Both clubs are, are going to be fighting for, for that position to, to go up at the end of the season. But I know it's a bit of a cliche at the moment. We can only really focus on, on what we've been doing right at the moment and what we need to work on in training. There's a lot of boys in the club that, that are relishing the opportunity to go against Saracens. Um, the, I know the coaches want to pit themselves against the best and, and there's all those international boys coming back in the fold for them. Uh, the boys are just really, really excited now, but we, we've got to treat them with the respect they deserve. Uh, but at the end of the day, it will boil down to an 80-minute game. We've um, we've spoken to a previous guests a little bit about um, sort of guys that have been in the champ a little bit longer than Baz, so maybe more more towards Guy this, is that there's obviously the news around funding. And obviously, it's quite top, topical at the moment with what's ha happened with the football over <laughs> the last 24 hours where football's just, I don't know, exploded or what it's done. But... Uh, it's it's a bizarre situation, but we've we've asked a few of the other guests like how how was how did that news sort of trickle through to you guys at Ealing and you know what's sort of your approach someone that's been around the block of a bit guy and you know what's how's it affected you as a group and you know what what are your thoughts on it? Oh, which bit, mate? Um, so just the, sort of when um, when the cuts were announced for the funding for the championship, yeah, uh, sort of February twenty twenty, it had been. So, you know, obviously it's been a, the COVID break in between, but yeah, I just wondered if it affected the guys at Ealing or was it just, just sort of play on as such there? Yeah, so so I was actually, when, when I heard about those cuts, obviously I was at Tigers at the time, yeah. and I, was, I was quite vocal on social media about it straight away. Um, I spoke out and said I didn't agree with it. There's, I, I've always been a massive advocate for the championship and it needs as much help as it can possibly get with funding. You don't play in the championship to become rich. You don't play in the championship because there's a load of money there. You play in that because you... You want to improve yourself day in, day out. You want to play against these players that have either stepped down or, or on the journey on the way up. And, and the championship has a huge amount of history and legacy. Um, so when those cuts were announced and you started seeing the impact of it doubled up with COVID and you saw clubs that were, were running GoFundMe pages and you, people were going on furlough and, and and all those issues around people not having jobs. And, and I listened to, to episode one with Paver talking about people not being able to pay their mortgages and things like that. And I think it's 
hopefully this will give it a real big eye opener into how important championship rugby really is not just for for the premiership but but for rugby as a whole in england at grassroots level i think ealing are, are in a position where those cuts haven't affected them as much as it has affected the clubs but it has definitely affected ealing as well so it's going to be tough for all the all the teams within the championship pushing forward and i really hope that the rfu do something about that moving forward yeah. As you said there, Guy, obviously you've been part of this uh, Ealing squad for this season. Um, but I guess where this Ealing squad is now is the culmination of a, a lot of good work over the last year. I think they first came into the league in, was it 2013? And are now, you know, at the, at the, at the top of the championship facing a, a big second half of the season for what could have been. Do you ever, as a group, stop and think about that, that journey? Or are you all, you know, standard each week as it comes and you're just looking forward? Yeah, I think that's driven from the top with with Wardy. He he's been influential and he he's been the man driving this dream of Ealing getting to the Premiership. I think he's been at the club for eighteen years now. I don't think he's really stepped back yet to appreciate how far he's come as a, as a coach and how far the club has come as a whole. They've got a dream, they've got an ambition to get to the Premiership, but it's not about just getting to the Premiership for them. It's about getting into the Premiership and staying. So I don't think people in, involved in the journey have appreciated exactly where they are yet but myself coming in from the outside I can really see how far they've come as a team and how far they've come as, as a rugby club as a whole the infrastructure they put in at Brunel University the the work they do within the community they're not looking at this as, as a as a as a team that just want to go in the prem they're looking about everything that goes with it not just on the pitch but off it as well and then on the uh, the flip side, Baz, obviously looking at this season and how big it is for Saracens, obviously a, a club that decorated and, and conquered all before them on, on, on a different, it's a very different type of challenge. So how has the second half of this season been spoke about within, within the camp at Saracens? Um, we've been speaking about it with excitement and stuff. It, uh, the, main, the most amazing thing is, is when the boys come back from the Six Nations, uh, I think it was the Six Nations, yeah, international duty, they came back with the attitude and uh, energy that was loved in the group. Like um, they brought it all in. They want to be part of this journey about bringing Saracens back up to the top of Europe. And it, it starts in the championship. And the challenge is in the championship now, this is our first first project, is let's go and win the championship. So well, it's a massive buy-in from all the internationals, from the coaching to the, the youngsters. Um, and we know the challenge ahead of us. Uh, we've got a big one this weekend as well. But... It's about relishing the challenge and enjoying it. And, uh, I, as a personal note, it's me wanting to put the club back where it was when I first came and stuff. And when I first came, the Saracens I joined was fighting for the top of the Premiership. So hopefully, um, if all goes well, then I, when, they, when I move on from Saracens, they'll be in the place that I, I left them in, where, where I came in. Gully, I've got, and I've got one for you now. Obviously, it's fascinating to hear the insight from both Guy and Baz about all the storylines that surround these two clubs going into what could be a, a, a massive moment in professional rugby union for the second flight and, and the first fight. Um, you're probably the, the closest to what we've got to it to a fan on this show. Obviously, I've got my allegiances with the club at Doncaster Knights. What what do you make of all of the uh, the battles at the top of the Premiership as someone that's been involved in the Championship as a player for so many years? How do you sort of perceive it as someone that, that follows the league very closely, has been so closely associated with it for so long? Uh, this weekend's fixture. Uh, and This weekend's fixture, the format and the fact that we've got these two sides battling at the top of it and the implications that the results could have on the uh, the wider professional game. I, th I think sort of, I, I played in the league for a long time, sort of 15 years and I, I can't remember the league having as much focus as this. I, you sort of sometimes look back through little rose tinted glasses when you, you know, I, I was a real fan of the the, uh, the playoffs format because um, it gave clubs I played for a chance to have a go at it. Um, you know, the, the team coming down is always the favourite team to go up, obviously, because, you know, because it is and they've, they've got the stronger players. But this this season, um, I've, I enjoyed the format. I, I, I like it. I like the fact that there's two teams in it that are genuine contenders, and there are Donny and Pirates that have, have thrown a spanner in the works. And it, it shows us that there is strength in the league, um, and it, it gives it a bit of, bit of, I don't know what's the word, a bit of. It definitely gets into more conversations, doesn't it? I think yeah, I've noticed. Yeah, I was just it. trying to think of 
the best best way of explaining it but it's it's a bit of a focus and a value and this is what we're all about it's the is value and i think what baz is saying and, and what guy is saying that they, these two guys value the league okay and, and the teams they're playing value the league um and that and that's the most important message i think and then as a result Games, games are getting streamed. That's a little bit to do with COVID, but there's, a, there's, there's good production going on along that. And it's just becoming a better product, I think, in, in general. I remember when I played, it was, and Edgy touched on this last weekend, and it was Sky were coming down once, maybe two times a season. Um, and with, with guys that didn't know much about the league, which I've said before, it's not their fault. They were just assigned to a, a role and they've not got anyone from Championship Rugby involved with the production of it. So it's great to see all of this side of it. I mean, back and Ben L were great on comms the other week <laughs> listening to those two and it's a, it's a you know it's a bit more I think championship life is a bit more real life I think sort of premiership is it's not it's not real life is it guys you've been there it's like you, you it's just a different world uh with champy champ life is, is a bit more real and a bit more raw um and, that, and that's what we're trying to do and I think people are seeing a little bit more of that now obviously this game's huge on Saturday so it talked about the values of the two guys here we touched on it at the start um of course prior to having premiership careers baz with saracens guy with wasps and leicester you were you were teammates at jersey um it would have been around about 2011 2012 so guy i believe you would have been part of the jersey squad and correct me if i'm wrong under ben harvey that got into the championship baz you were there that first season when actually you sent donny down and uh, stayed in the league but uh I'd love to hear sort of your experiences of your time in Jersey and maybe some of the comparisons to the environments that you've been in since. So I'll leave it to whoever wants to go first. Go ahead. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I'll, ju I'll jump in on that at the start. Um, so for me, I joined I joined Jersey in National One um, when we were actually fighting against Ealing and, and I was part of that journey of going up towards a championship. We, we had an ambition that year. We started off relatively poorly, uh, but... but Behind the scenes, everything was really, really sort of amateur type level. We were still training on Tuesday, Thursday nights. Um, there, there was about sort of six or seven prof sort of professional boys and, and they were making the move to get up the league. We managed to, to get promoted that year and that, that's when Baz joined us. And, and there was still that, that core of the club that there was people working in the office in Jersey during the day and they were joining us Tuesday, Thursday nights. And there was people that were like Barrington and myself. We were looking at what could be in Jersey. What what was the next step? Were we looking to to push on and improve? We were really really lucky. I'm, I'm sure Baz will say the same. Is we had some really really good players there, such as uh, sort of Di Bishop, Ben Evans, Barry Davis, Welsh boys that had been around the block, that had played a higher level, that dropped down, and and they gave us a really insight as to what it was like to play professional rugby or higher. So that enabled us to drive the standards a little bit more. That year that we managed to stay up in the championship was, was something that probably one of my favourite moments. And I know that you're, you're at Doncaster now and you went down that year, but no one gave us a chance at the start of that year. And the one thing that we really had was a bit of belief within us and a team spirit that we didn't want to let the island down and we didn't want to let each other down. No, I could touch on that, uh, Guy. I, uh, one of my favourite games was Jersey versus Doncaster. It was a Friday night. I think it was the second to last game of the season. Uh, I can remember because I was pretty nervous. I was only 22 at the time, and it was a massive dependent on us if the island was going to stay in the championship. And uh, I played finals with Saracens and stuff, but just remembering, like, if this penalty doesn't go right at this scrum time and they kick here, Jersey could go down, kind of thing. So, yeah. I'd, looking back from my career, I can remember that game quite. It was a cold Friday night. I think I was coming against Thomas Francis or something like that. But yeah, it was uh, definitely, unfortunately for my year, Donny didn't get the win but um, it was good for Jersey to stay up that year definitely to kick on as well I think they it's a great block for them to kick on from that wasn't it yeah they've done really well since then haven't they and, you know it's it's a good story in itself alongside sort of the other ones within the, within the champ that if you got your Hartbury's your, your Amtils uh, Ealing have all been on similar journeys to to Jersey um, just obviously we, we've got a few mutual friends and you know I think we'll know Michael Le Bourgeois and I've dropped him a message and I just wondered if you could share any sort of more more lighthearted stories of your time on the with Messrs Bouge and, and some of some of the other boys that are within within the squad. Go on, guy. You can uh, you can stitch over Bouge. Yeah, the guy. Guy yeah. just said, <laughs> guy just said I uh, Bouge just said I and Apa back to guy, and that's all he said. Uh, <laughs> so I I'm not going to stitch Bouge up, but. Um... 
Yeah, the Iron Apple story. I'll tell you the Iron Apple story if you want. That was just as I was uh, I was coming up through the leagues. Not coming up through the leagues. I'd, I'd been at university and did Gloucester for a year as the academy and I didn't make it. And um, I was relatively inexperienced. I didn't understand anything about the championship at the time, um, rugby-wise. So rather than knuckling down and going back through the leagues and trying to play, I just went on holiday for two weeks and stayed in Iron Apple for, for eight months as a, as a rep out there. <laughs> I love that. That's clear. Yeah, it's not not one of my proudest moments, I'll be honest. <laughs> and, and then Baz used to frequent the the traff a bit, was it? Is that right? Uh, What's that? You used to frequent the uh, the traff with with Big Neil. Uh, oh, the Trafalgar. Oh, Trafalgar. Trafalgar. Sorry, Trafalgar, yeah. yeah. Sorry, the traff. The traff. I was I was, I was I've a bit of memory loss there, but yeah, I really remember the Trafalgar. Yeah, I'll tell you, that's where Bouge did live. If you ever wanted to find uh, Michael on a Sunday. You know exactly where he was. And is that down. where is that where the, uh, the sort of the famous remix was was born in in that? <laughs> I, ne- I never never thought I was a good singer and stuff. I think I think uh, the remix was when I started singing over there actually, and no one really knew the song, so I just flipped on to another one. Uh, <laughs> no, we did have a good sing along, a few good drinks down there. It was a good time down there, wasn't it, guy? It's, uh, I'll, be, I'll be honest, so Trafalgar is one of the places where they used to lock the coach out just so the players could get away with what they wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Champ rugby at its finest, honestly, that's why we play the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. We love hearing. It was, it was amazing for a good Sunday session, to be fair. Always a few games to play down there. Good yeah, plan. and Jersey does still remain, obviously, in non-COVID times, one of the, the favourite away trips. But um you're both fantastic examples here of the uh, the championship offering a spotlight to to kick on to to other things, different things. Of course, I think Baz, prior to being at Jersey, you were part of the uh, Harvey College setup there. Obviously, a, a fine rugby institution, but Jersey offered you your sort of first professional chance. And obviously, uh, guy, you mentioned you've been in the Gloucester Academy out of it, spell at Richmond before Jersey, and then kicking on to Wasps. Um, you're two fine examples, and we do keep finding these fine examples that keep coming on the show when we ask them. It's remarkable, really, of the championship proving its worth as a development tool. Um, Baz, we'll go with you first. Do, do you think that season that you had in the champ was really what set you up for the opportunity at Saracens? Uh, definitely, yeah. It's uh, when my career it started off with uh, Hartbury, uh, uh, Hartbury College, and we, we had to go up through the leagues, similar to Jersey, what Guy was chatting about. And as a as a scrummaging, I used to be a back row, but when I started learning my trade in the front row, I um I don't know how I was a, a back row, very slow, <laughs> very slow back row, maybe not a good op- good maybe not a good uh, jumping option, but yeah. scrummaging back row, yeah, that, that, that's how they sell it these days. Yeah, uh, yeah. we played uh, learning my trade in um, Southwest One, uh, National National uh, Three South, and National Two South, and coming up with Hartbury. It was a massive learning curve for me, especially at Loosehead, because you used to play against these massive propping for the last 20 years of their life. And they used to tuck you up. And then, then you'd play and under it. Then you'd play like a 20-year-old. And then you'd be like, Jesus, I know what I'm doing and stuff. And then going into the um, uh, jersey, uh, uh, biggest packs I've ever scrummed against, uh, alongside like Talon and stuff, uh, Rotherham away. I can remember playing Rotherham away and I played tight at that game. I think it was my first game, Harvey just threw me in there. I thought I was getting subbed off. So I started walking off and he was like, no, 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 I'm on, I'm on US run at tight end. I was like, oh God. But I playing them packs and they were over a thousand kgs. Like the scrummaging back then against Rotherham was so difficult. I can remember how big they were. I can just looking up at all of them from one to eight. It was, it was a, a lesson learned there, I'll tell you that. So you've you've touched it there. So actually, your your rugby groundings actually come from even further down the pyramid with Hartbury, from all the way sort of like lower down, sort of like levels five and four, Baz. Yeah, I've I've I've, I've um, won national three south, national two south. I, I haven't got national one yet, but uh, or championship yet. So hope fingers crossed. But uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully in the future. But yeah, no, I've started. Um, uh, quite low uh, with Hartbury coming up for the leagues, and uh, it was a massive learning curve for me as a, a young, a young front rower. And I would uh, recommend it to any uh, academy, young academy boys, to just make sh- to make sure you get the game time by playing games, and and uh, and it's a massive um, stepping stone going through your career. I was just thinking of your the amount of medals you've got, mate. Listening <laughs> for all that, like, 
Where, where's your Nat 3 medal? You still got that? <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere. It'll be, to be fair, my mum moved house about uh, just before COVID. She moved house and she had all her, or she just gave me two big boxes of <laughs> so much rugby stuff. I was like, mum, I haven't seen this stuff in years. Like, <laughs> but now. <laughs> I think it was one a picture of me at like uh, England students. And I was like, I completely forgot I played for them, but it was a great time <laughs> in Portugal. But yeah, I tell you that was that was a very fun tour to Portugal with England students. Yeah, and that he and was that, coaching then. I think it was Leggy. Uh, I, I haven't seen him through the coaching staff uh, recently, but yeah, he was a good boy. I tell you, he was a good good lad. And then, Guy, I guess, not a wildly dissimilar story, obviously, with Richmond in National 1, Jersey with National 1, Championship with Jersey, and then on to Wasps. Um, do, do you, I guess, attribute that that time through the, the National Leagues as a big determining factor in your premiership career? Yeah, a million percent. Um, it actually started before Richmond. When I got back from that uh, fateful Iron Apple trip, I ended up playing for Hereford in... Uh, I think it was like really low down. I think it was lower than National League rugby, and it was just turning up to play at the weekend with my mates, with a beer, with a beer, and 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 I learned more about men's rugby playing grassroots level and lower down than, than anything because you're coming against older people that might not have played a high standard, but they knew how to cheat and they knew how to get a cheap shot on you because you were the young guy coming through. I then obviously moved to Richmond where we played against Jersey in National Two, and then and then sort of national one with Jersey. We won that. And then into the, see Baz, if you'd have joined us a year earlier, you would have got your national one trophy. Mate. <laughs> <laughs> but then wow. into the championship. It was time. <laughs> and then into the championship was what I saw is possibly the highest level I might be able to play because obviously I didn't make it when I was at Gloucester. I got told, not got told, but I, I got released and I didn't really know where to go. So when I did eventually get into the championship, I was like, right, how high can I go? How far can I go? How how much can I push this? And the championship for me was was such an eye opener that the amount of talent that was in there and the, and the size of the players we were playing against was was for me just a different level to anything I've been around or, or against before. It, I got I got really lucky um, at the end of the year when I managed to get that move for Wasps. It, it was a tough decision because I was enjoying my time in Jersey, but. If it wasn't for the Championship Rugby, I wouldn't have had an opportunity in the Premiership. Simple as that. So, Guy, that brings us to an interesting one. Of course, you, you went from Jersey into these uh, in Premiership environments in Wasps and, and in Leicester. Um, and now you're at Ealing. And obviously, the environment that's been created there, I think, has been likened to, uh, you know, as almost from outside. I don't know. I'm not part of that environment. From what I've heard from speaking to people, has been as professional as any in the Premiership. What's... Your opinion of the sort of environment that's been created for, at Ealing, how does it stack up against those at, uh, at Watson Leicester? Yeah, I think um, I, I feel very privileged and lucky to have been involved in, in a Wasps culture that was unbelievable and then going into a culture like Tigers that was historically so successful. Learned a huge amount. Going into the Ealing setup, I didn't know what to expect. Had a really good chat with Wardy before I joined. Um, but what, what I can say is they are doing everything right at the moment but they're also doing it in the right way they're not they haven't bit off more than they can chew they haven't just decided one year to say right we're going to be a premiership club and throw money at it what they've done they've built an infrastructure with the the links to the university with the academy they're building the facilities at the moment are, are better than some premiership clubs like that at hands down they're building a new training facility and they're doing things. They've let themselves grow organically by finishing second the last sort of three or four years. They've given themselves the right opportunity to grow and become a premiership side. They know it's not going to happen overnight. They've, there's been a huge amount of work that's gone in. And I think the recruitment of certain players has been has been really good for them. People like Stephen Shingler that had been in and around international squads at Fly Half and Craig Willis who, who'd been in and around Falcons. Rain Smith who went over to, to Bristol, come back as captain. These are players that have seen uh, winning environments. They've seen premiership cultures. They've come back. They, they've taken key leadership roles within within these areas, within the squad. And they're helping drive the standards in training and drive the standards off the pitch forward in order that when Ealing do have the opportunity to go up, to go up they'll, they'll make the most of it. I think um, it's really interesting to hear that. And of course, I think all the interest now that we've talked about in the league is basically probably going to focus into what will be a two-leg promotion playoff. Um, it's fascinating to hear you two guys talk about how 
playing at lower levels within the English pyramid uh, has influenced your career. Baz, as you say, won all the national leagues nearly and uh, guy in national one with, with Richmond. Um, promotion relegation has become a very hot topic at the moment. There are reports in, in various publications that maybe it might be put on ice until after 2024 with a, a um, intention to expand the league to 14 teams. Um, how and you know i'm not going to ask you to hang yourself out to dry here but what what are your guys opinions on relegation i'll, I'll put mine out obviously as sort of a, a, a support of grassroots and championship rugby i don't see it being good for the game but be interested to get all three of your insights yeah i think like for me i i think um you guys touched on it when you went at jersey at donny and it was i had one when i was at coventry we played wakefield and it was I think we needed nine points from the last two games to stay to stay in the, the, the national one, but the equivalent championship back then. And that, looking back, one of my fondest memories in rugby because I think because of the trepidation, you know, it's that the worry and there's, there's a it's going down to the wire right to the death. And I think if that's um, if that goes, then you know, look at what's happening. At, like, it's difficult for you guys to, to speak, but looking at like what's that going on at Worcester at the minute, and they just seem to have given up this year and. They're getting pumped by 50 points every week and it's no good for anyone that uh, new investors or for the league so there is that worry you know super 14 went pop as well didn't it or super 12 14 then to 18 and then what what is it now they're, they're back back in their own countries just going with um australia and, and, and respective league of new zealand so there is a worry around that for me personally but i, I don't know what your guys thoughts are on it I'll um I'll just go straight out and say it. I, I'm a massive believer in promotion and relegation. A hundred percent, it should be. Look at I was involved in a game for Leicester Tigers against Newcastle a few years ago. Bottom of the table clash. No one watches that game if there's not a relegation on the line. Suddenly everybody turns up. It's a massive game and everybody wants to be a part of it. And it and it gives the league something. How can I? I believe it should be a 14 team league. I don't know what other people think. I believe that with the amount of players that are developing in England at the moment, the younger players that are how, that are in premiership clubs but are getting no opportunities to play because they're, they're, fearing, um, they're fearing this relegation and stuff. It doesn't mean that these players shouldn't play. There should be promotion relegation with 14 teams to spread that talent out over the whole premiership. And then you can have, you can look at either having a playoff between the 14th team and the top of the, the champ. You can have a look at two up, two down. You can have a look at one up, one down. You can analyse that at a later date. But at the moment, while rugby's at a point because of COVID, there could be real change within our sport. The championship needs more help. It needs more funding because it's a breeding ground for success. The premiership can be go to 14 teams because there's a huge amount of rugby talent out there that needs to play. And everybody just needs to realise now is the time to do it. And I don't know why they're not. Fair point. I've got to follow that. I do. <laughs> <laughs> There's there's loads of different ways um, with relegation and all over the world there is like I I'm quite fond on how the French do actually over in the top 14 Uh, I I might be completely wrong but like one goes up 13th on the the league plays the winner out of two to six on a playoff thing there's loads of ways you can do it and stuff so just looking at all the options and making sure that we we go back to making sure we get the right decisions from the grassroots we get the right decisions what the fans want to do and it's what um the players want to do and uh, as long as every all of them line up i think then whatever option they do is as long as we're listening to all them three people then yeah there's loads of different ways you can look at the relegation or playing left or right i just yeah i think as well i just it, it, it needs to be there. As soon as it goes to a closed shop, then, then there's the worry. Now, if there's always opportunity to go into the Premiership, and I understand the Premiership's point of view to a certain degree, and, you know, they're protecting themselves. Yeah, I get that. You know, there's, there's, you know, there's a few clubs that have lost money over the years, and I can kind of understand it, but I think it, it, does, need, it does need the promotion relegation for it to generate interest and, and new interest into the sport that, that you know, is potentially there for us moving forward. I think for me that when we look at English rugby, I think of it as something that that starts down in Yorkshire Five, Southwest Five, and it goes all the way through to the Premiership, and that's all one thing. And it's a, it is a pyramid, it is a journey. And I think that the danger that you have when you separate one from the rest 
even if it is I suppose for a three or four year period is that there is a disconnection and it becomes exclusive and it then becomes something that not everybody's part of we've seen in football with the proposed european super league this week a, a, a select group of teams trying to change something that isn't just theirs it's everybody's and i think that's the and, I, and it, there was an outcry with fans you know, boris johnson leave it, making statements about it and, it and it's and it's fallen on its backside by the looks of things and i think you can draw comparisons to what might happen if promotion relegation is allowed to be forfeited for a while and, and for me it doesn't sit right but yeah I, I don't know what the answer is and I think there is as a guy said there is opportunity here as we stand on COVID for big change but for me I don't think that getting rid of the, the challenge of promotion and relegation is the answer uh, I think there's, there's I don't know to touch on it but I think as a collective uh, the championship has no representation as, as players like you'll know that and I don't know if the, the player's voice could be heard more, whether there's, there's, there's scope for a, a, a championship committee of players. And then I know there's one at club level, but, you know, and, and these ideas get shared. I, I just think now's the time for us to, to to share the ideas and the concerns and, you know, throw some ideas out and our voice needs to be heard. Um, how we do that, like you say, Mike, it's a little bit tricky, but there's an opportunity here for us to to go and shout about it and um, and come up with some solutions and not just just put, point out the problems and you know I th I'm sure there's a solution out there for, for more funding within the league if if given that opportunity from from the the powers that be. I think we've covered some uh, very valuable stuff there and some very interesting stuff. I'm going to sort of close off with the uh, the final uh, sort of question to you. Obviously, ahead of this weekend's game. Ealing versus Saracen. I, I just want a little bit of a one line of, of where it sits in both of your sort of relative careers and where it stacks up as sort of importance. I know it's different and I know there's playoffs to come, but I look at it as a massive game. Do you two guys both see it the same? Whoever wants to jump in first. <laughs> go on, Baz. You can do it. No, you can go first, guy. Come on, you're skinnier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look... Um... It is a massive, a massive game. It's a really good opportunity for us to benchmark where we are as a squad at the moment. We played Saris a few times this year, but we understand this isn't the Saris team we played previously. They've got their internationals back. They've got their British Lions back. For us, let's benchmark where we are at the moment. We're giving them the respect they deserve, but it'll be a good indicator of where we need to improve moving forward. So if it is us in the, in the playoff final, we, we don't know yet. Um, we, we'll have a good idea of, of where we need to improve on, what we need to work on. No, very, very similar to Guy. Um, it's been a it's been a good good film, film around the camp this week. Um, we know this is the biggest game of the season so far. Like Guy said, hopefully we make it to the playoff final, and they're, they're obviously going to be bigger. Um, but this is a this is a good good game for both teams to rip into each other and see see um, see what happens on Sunday. Really, that was the Championship Club podcast with Michael Casey and Ben Gulliver. Check us out on social media at Champ Clubs Pod on Instagram and Twitter and subscribe and like our YouTube channel.